record right now. Um, I hadn't <laughs> actually managed to record any of our first Friday events thus far, virtual ones, because I just keep forgetting to do it. So I'm feeling pretty proud of myself that I remembered to hit the record button. Um, so, and our uh, social media manager, um, Greg Hardison, um, does plan to actually um, share this video to our YouTube channel. Um, so it will be available later. Um, we encourage you to share it with folks um, who uh, may be interested. Uh, and we'll certainly um, share information about how you can get a copy of Susan's book uh, as well. So, all right. Uh, without further ado then, and I'll keep ad admitting people as we go, but uh, welcome Susan, please take it away. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me okay? All right, good, good. Thank you very much, Carol, I appreciate that. And I appreciate being invited by the Kentucky Historical Society to do this presentation. I actually uh, have been a member of KHS on and off for years and have attended many of these as a guest. So it was a real pleasure to be asked to be here to be the speaker. Thanks to all of you who've joined us by Zoom. A shout out to my friend Peggy and to Sheila from Seattle. I used to live in Seattle. Um, so welcome to all of you. Today I'm here to talk about the story of the story, how I came to write this book and some of what I discovered along the way. This, uh, so first a quick summary of what the book is about. This is the true story of two families from, of enslaved people from Southwestern Kentucky. They lived just a little bit south of the Hopkinsville area. It, for those of you who are familiar with Kentucky, that's just above the Tennessee state line. Now these people were freed and then migrated to Liberia, Africa in 1836. It's also though the parallel story of Ben Major, the man who freed them. Now he actually grew up right here in Frankfort. He was born and raised in Frankfort, Kentucky. His parents were John Major and Judith Trebu Major. So any of you who are from the Frankfort area, if you know people with those surnames, they are probably descendants of this man um, or his re related to him somehow. So the story tracks his life uh, as he leaves Frankfurt, he goes to New Orleans briefly, then he comes to Southwestern Kentucky and settles there. And then later uh, in his life, he ends up moving to central Illinois. In order to tell this, these stories, the stories of the people who were freed, as well as the story of Ben Major, of course, the story involves slavery. It involves, uh, that was the most divisive issue in American history. I think that that's not something that most people would argue. And the early history of Liberia, Africa. But it also involves the hotly debated colonization movement. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. Some quick background on me. I was born and raised in Washington State. But I had ancestors who lived in Christian County, Kentucky in the early 1800s. And so I moved to Kentucky in the year 2000. And one of my brothers who's interested in family history asked me to do some research on these people who had lived in Kentucky. And while doing that research, I came across the story of this man, Ben Major. Now, Ben is not related to me, but he was a close friend and neighbor of my great-great-great-grandfather. In fact, I have great aunts who are named for Ben's wife and one for Ben's name for Ben's mother. And, excuse me, for Ben's wife and for Ben's sister. So the families were really close, and they, uh, Ben and my ancestor had a lot in common. As I said, they both lived in Christian County, Kentucky. At that time in the 1830 census, that county was 46% 40, of the population of that county was enslaved, almost half. And that's because of the number of uh, hemp farms and tobacco farms that are in that area. Uh, any of you who have ever had experience with tobacco, you know that's a very labor intensive crop. And so that was a much higher percentage of uh, enslaved people in that county than almost anywhere else in Kentucky. That was uncommon for Kentucky to have that high a percentage. Um, both men were also early and active members of a denomination called the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. And in fact, my ancestor was a preacher in that denomination and uh, Ben was often called reverend, even though he never was a, a formally a preacher, but both of them were very involved in the church. 
Both had been slave owners in Kentucky, and both men moved with their families to central Illinois in the early 1830s. So one of the first things that I came across about Ben Major was just a short paragraph that said this man had freed his enslaved people and that they had migrated to Liberia and that they, they then wrote letters back and forth to him for years, for 15 years, and their letters still existed. So just that paragraph triggered this whole thing. Um, I was immediately curious about why this happened and the, the other details about it. So before I go into that though, let me give you a little bit more information about the two, about the people who were freed. So the people Ben freed included two brothers, their names were Tolbert and Austin Major, um, as was the case for many people who were enslaved, they used the surname of their owner. Both of them uh, were single dads, and Austin Major had three little kids, and Tolbert Major had two little kids. Ben also owned two teenage girls. Their names were Anne and Sylvie, and their mother was a woman named Agnes Harlan, who was also enslaved. She lived on a neighboring plantation, and she had five little boys in addition to the two girls. Now, these people were not alone in seeking new lives in Africa. There was a group called the American Colonization Society, and this was a private group. It was never a government agency. It was founded in 1816 and was active until 1913, almost a century. Over those 93 years, 16,000 black people left the racism, violence, and oppression of the United States for new lives in Liberia. As far as I can tell, this was the largest out-migration in U.S. history. And uh, there, there's a sort of a standard narrative about the colonization movement that this was about kicking all the black people, all the free black people out of the United States. There is some truth to the racism involved, it, but it's not the whole story. And the Colonization Society, in their founding documents, emphasized voluntary migration. They were not about deporting people or, or exiling people. And I'll go into some detail in a minute. The next image uh, is a receipt. Now, this is a piece of paper about the size of a check. Um, Carol, can we have that image up? Yes, here it comes. And um, this piece of paper still exists. Uh, I've actually held this piece of paper. So when Ben went to Illinois, he could not, obviously could not bring his enslaved people with him because that was a free state. But he knew by then that he wanted to free them and he knew by then that they, they wanted to go to Liberia. So he left them with his brother Joseph who stayed on in Kentucky. Now there were not, because the Colonization Society was this private group, they were not wealthy, they were sustained by dues and subscriptions to their publications and donations. So they didn't own a big fleet of ships, right? They didn't have regularly departure, regularly scheduled departures. So what they did was they sent colonization agents around the country to talk to people about the movement and to gather names of people who were interested. And when they had enough people who were committed to going, then they chartered a boat and hired a crew to take the, the ship to Africa. So the colonization agent came through Kentucky. And at that point, Joseph turned over Ben's people to the colonization society. Another brother, a man named Chastain Major, had also um, freed at least one, I don't think much more than that, one, maybe two, of his enslaved people for migration as well. So this receipt says, received of Joseph Major, the immigrants of Benjamin Major and Chastain Major in number 11, also $115 for the use of said immigrants. And that's dated May 20th, 1836. This is literally a receipt for human beings. It was chilling to hold this, um, but it was also their ticket to freedom. It was their ticket to a new life. So Tolbert, Austin, Agnes, and their families 
and many other people from Kentucky and from Northern Tennessee who had been freed, went with this colonization agent by boat up the Cumberland River to the Ohio River and then to, to Pittsburgh and then on to Staten Island in New York. On July 5th, 1836, the day after Independence Day, which I think has this wonderful poetic sense to it, because it was literally their Independence Day, they all boarded a ship called the Luna and set sail for Liberia. So I'm gonna read a passage to you from the book. This is from chapter six. In this passage, I talk about crewmen, and that is spelled K-R-U. The crew were one of the indigenous groups that was living in Liberia at the time. We have all landed on the shores of Africa. Austin Major stood at the bow of the Luna and stared at the horizon, impatient to see land again. They had been at sea for more than six weeks, and the excitement and novelty of the voyage had worn off long ago. His children, Mary, Carolyn, and Thomas, were weary of being confined aboard a vessel, and the adults were more than ready to begin their new lives. It was August 19th, and here, so close to the equator, the sun blazed hot and glared off the waves. Land, a sailor shouted, land ahead. Austin gazed intently and saw a hazy bump in the distance. Passengers scrambled to the rail, pointing and chattering. The bump became larger and clearer until the passengers glimpsed the lush beauty of Cape Mescherado, the site of Monrovia, Liberia. The rocky brush-covered cliff towered 80 feet straight up from the pounding surf. Several hundred feet from the base of the cliff, Captain Hallett commanded the crew to drop anchor. Austin saw no wharf. He glanced down at the surface of the water 15 or 20 feet below and wondered how on earth they would get to shore. He spotted a group of African men launching large dugout canoes from a small beach under the cape. The men were powerfully built and naked except for loincloths. As they neared the ship, Austin saw that each man had a blue line tattooed from his forehead to the tip of his nose. Some of them bore additional tattoos on their cheeks. Reverend Herring had told him about the distinctive marks worn by the men of the crew tribe. Austin had never seen such tattoos and a shiver traced his spine. The Luna's crew dropped a rope ladder to the nearest canoe. Ignoring the doubts that nibbled at the edge of his consciousness, Austin clambered down and stepped into the canoe with the barely clothed strangers. The ship rocked, the ladder swayed. He glanced up at Tolbert who handed down Austin's children and then his own sons. Agnes's oldest boy, Lewis, descended into another canoe and helped his younger brothers, Asbury, Wesley, Coke, and Fletcher, down the rope ladder. The skirts worn by the women and older girls made descent on the ladder dangerous, but Captain Hallett had an ingenious solution. The crew brought a chair topside, and one at a time they tied each woman and girl, including Tyloa, Agnes, and her daughters, Anne and Sylvie, into the sea then used a hook and tackle to hoist the chair over the rail. Each female dangled for a heart-stopping moment above the waves before being lowered to the waiting canoes. The crewmen paddled for shore but stopped short of the beach. One of them leaped into chest-deep water and steadied the boat. Another crewman, tall and strong, slipped into the water, then extended his arms toward Mary, Austin's five-year-old. Before Austin could stop her, Mary smiled and slid into the African's arms. She traced her fingers over the blue lines on his face as he carried her to the beach. Several men and women dressed in clothing more familiar to the passengers had gathered on the shore. One woman took Mary's hand and greeted her in English. The crewman waded back to the canoe. Tolbert, Austin, and Lewis stepped into the water too and carried the other children ashore one by one. Austin helped Agnes and Lewis piggybacked his sisters to shore. Austin breathed deeply of Africa, the heavy scent of unfamiliar flowers, dried fish, wood fires, and salt water mingled in the steamy air. He ran his hands through his hair stiff with sea spray. Monrovia wasn't their final destination. The captain was delivering mail and cargo and the crew would take on fresh water and supplies before heading down the coast to Bassa Cove. All of their belongings remained on board, but the captain had encouraged them to explore Monrovia. 
Mary ran to join Austin and he swung her up on his shoulders. Carolyn and Thomas made their way through the loose sand to their father's side. Some of the Monrovian men directed them toward a trail. The Majors and Harlands, the Buckners, the Haynes family, the Herrings and other Luna passengers made their way up the half mile path from the beach, winding up the stony trail to the cliff top town. Austin felt his calf and thigh muscles tighten as he climbed the hill. It felt good to stretch his legs. They reached the top and the settlement spread out before them. Austin saw wide grassy streets and at least two churches. Houses and businesses were built of wood and stone. Some were utilitarian and little more than shacks. Others were wood frame houses, as handsome as anything he'd seen in Kentucky. Painted white with neat green shutters and surrounded by tidy vegetable gardens. Mary struggled to get off his shoulders. He set her down and she ran ahead to catch up with her brother, sister, and cousins. Austin glanced back at the sea below. The Luna and several other ships flying foreign flags waited at anchor. He took one more look at the wide expanse of ocean stretching forever back to America, then joined his family. So obviously that's the um, arrival in, in Monrovia. They then traveled down the coast to a smaller town called Bassett Cove. So let me talk a little bit about why I decided to write this book. First of all, it was purely curiosity for me. As I said, I had read this very brief paragraph about Ben Major, and some of the questions that that triggered was, you know, why did Ben Major, who I learned was descended from a very long line of slave owners, clear back to pre-revolutionary war, why did he decide to free them, to go against everything he, these notions he had been raised with? Did those newly emancipated people want to go to another country? Did they have a choice in the matter? What would life in Africa have been like for them? Did they survive? And what was the colonization movement about? Were those supporters motivated by noble intentions or nefarious ones? Excuse me. <coughs> I found many of the answers in the correspondence Tolbert and Austin and some of the others wrote letters to Ben for 15 years. Those letters still exist. They are housed in a museum, McLean County Museum of History in Bloomington, Illinois. This is a scan of Tolbert's first letter to Ben. <coughs> it opens with, Dear Sir, we have all landed on the shores of Africa and got into our houses. We have been here three weeks. None of us have been taken with the fever yet. We have a prospect of war with the natives. This letter hints at what lies ahead for the settlers. My second motive was a desire to preserve and share this story. I feel like um, the story of colon the colonization movement has been really given short shrift. Um, I don't recall learning much about it in school. And uh, I think that the history of that particular movement was overshadowed later by the events of the Civil War. So when I started doing this research and started talking to people about it, most people seemed to be really interested. It seemed to be news to them that this had ever happened. Um, and I make a living as a manuscript editor. So I work with authors and with publishing people in the publishing business all the time. And at one point, someone said to me, I think this would make a good book. And I hadn't really thought about it as a book prior to that. I was just researching it for my own curiosity. And all of a sudden, it took on new purpose and urgency when I decided, well, maybe this could be. Maybe this could be a book. Um, and the third motive is to really honor the memory of Tolbert and Austin Major and their families, Agnes Harlan and her family, and Ben Major. I want to... Um, tell their story in the light of this bigger story of the colonization of Liberia. So this is a nonfiction book. Um, and to do a nonfiction book, you have to do a whole lot of research. And I've often compared research of this type to assembling a huge jigsaw puzzle. 
many thousands of pieces. Those pieces are scattered over several different states. They are mixed in with pieces of other puzzles that have nothing to do with this. Many of the pieces are missing and they are gone forever. They either never existed or they're missing completely. You're not gonna find that piece under the couch. And the biggest challenge is there is no box lid. There's no picture of what the final thing will look like. So I was doing research on blind faith, hoping that I would find enough pieces to assemble a clear picture, to be able to tell this story. I knew it was critical to get the details right. When you're writing nonfiction, that's really important. So I looked at multiple sources. I tried to make sure those sources were credible, reliable sources. Um, I tried to document everything that I found. I took extensive notes. I had reams of um, photocopies and I made a lot of digital scans so that I could look at documents later on and, and check back to make sure I had my facts straight. I also knew that when you write nonfiction, you need to cite your sources for different things, either in footnotes or endnotes and, and, or it, and in a bibliography as well. So I had to be very careful about tracking where I got different pieces of information from. Now, fortunately, I had help in all of this. Early in the process, I was talking about this story in my research to one of my cousins, a woman named Pam Robertson. And she was very excited about this. And she said, I would love to help you do research if you're interested in having some help. I was thrilled to have her help. And that was critically important because not only did Pam provide hands-on help in terms of making copies or pulling books off shelves and that kind of thing, but that we traveled a lot. We traveled to several different states and spent a week in Washington, DC doing this research. And on those long car trips, we talked about what we had found, how we thought the pieces fit together. What do we think this meant? How, how should that be interpreted as part of the whole? So it was just really helpful to brainstorm with somebody else about all this research and how it was coming together. We looked at print sources, things like academic journals, books, courthouse records that included things like marriage records, wills, land records. Um, Family records, I was able to track down two women who are sisters and are descendant, direct descendants of Ben Major. Old newspapers were a terrific resource. And I read more than 300 letters from other Liberian settlers because I wanted to have a, a broader picture of that experience and what that was like for them. Now 300 might sound like a lot, but as I said, think about that total number, 16,000 that I mentioned earlier, if 16,000 people went over there, the fact that we have 300 letters or so doesn't seem you know, quite so remarkable. I used online sources as well. One of the great things now for research is that much of this information has been digitized, it's available online. But of course, we all know not everything on the internet is true, right? And so I had to make sure that those online sources were, were credible and reliable. And so I used, um, websites that belong to museums, to archives, to um, universities, and so to try and make sure that information was correct. And as I said, we also traveled. We went directly to universities, museums, archives. We spent time walking through cemeteries, reading cemetery records. And then uh, one of the sisters that I met lives, still lives in the major family home in a town called Eureka, Illinois. And uh, she said, you know, my mom gave those letters a long time ago to the museum, but we have a lot of Ben's other stuff in the attic. Would you like to come and look through it? Which is just an incredible invitation. So Pam and I went and spent a few weekends in a dusty attic in Illinois. I also worked directly with individuals, not just these women who were descendants of, the, of Ben Major, but also people who had lived in Liberia or written about Liberia, traveled extensively there, people who were Liberian, are Liberian, um, some of them are still living in the United, in, some of them are still living in Liberia and some are currently living in the United States. And I joined a group called the Liberian Studies Association, which is a large international group of people who study and research both Liberia's history as well as contemporary Liberia. They hold an annual conference and in 2015, I was asked to speak about my research on this book 
And in 2020, I was invited to come back and speak again. Unfortunately, that, that conference was canceled because of COVID. But obviously, in order to put the stories of these people, Ben, Tolbert, Austin, Agnes, and their families, in order to put that story into context, I had to research that larger issue of slavery, the colonization movement, and Liberia's early history. And in particular, I really did want to understand the motivations that people had for supporting this idea of colonization. And I wanted to understand if those motives were, as this longstanding narrative has it, if those motives were purely racist, if they were purely about kicking black people out of the country. What I found was there was truth to that. It was not wrong in that, that there was a lot of truth to that. Many of the founders were absolutely were racist. But I found that the, the real story was more complex. It was more nuanced than that. There were lots of other motives as well. One motive was to increase trade with West Africa. Um, the United States outlawed the importation of slaves in 1808. Now the slave trade still continued along the west coast of Africa as slaves were exported to um, the Caribbean, to Haiti, to Brazil, and to other countries. Um, and one notion was the idea of, it was, a, it was a missionary notion to have people who had been raised in America as Christians, to have them living in Africa, they could, you know, they could Christianize the African tribes. Um, one notion was if you took people who had been enslaved themselves and put them along the west coast of Africa, they could help interrupt the slave trade, which indeed they, they made act, they made, had some success in doing that. And finally, there was a, a humanitarian notion that anybody uh, who thought about emancipating slaves at that time would have recognized that even people, once they were freed from slavery, certainly did not lead, lead lives that were equal to white Americans. There were laws called black codes that limited where they could go, what kind of jobs they could hold, where they could live. It was a, it was a very restricted and constrained life. And so I think there certainly were people who felt like this gave emancipated slaves the best chance at a new life, to live in a place where they could truly be free. So I hit some research milestones along the way, um, and anybody who's done this kind of research has similar stories. The first thing that I wanted to do was make sure the transcriptions of the letters I had were as accurate and complete as possible. Years ago, someone had done some transcriptions of these letters for McLean County Museum of History. and. Uh, so Pam and I went up to the museum and the museum was kind enough to also let us work with the original letter. So one of us would hold the transcribed version and one would hold the original letter. And we went literally line by line, sometimes word by word, and sometimes even letter by letter to compare those two things and make sure the transcriptions were complete and accurate. Now, as you can see from this example, the paper is faded. Uh, it's written in a very old-fashioned cursive. Some of the ink is faded. Some of the letters have physical holes in them. And men, in many places, the transcriber had written illegible. So we were trying to figure out what some of these words meant. And at one point, Pam had a ma magnifying glass out and was looking at one letter and she said, I think this says Lobelia, but that doesn't make sense. Well, many of you know Lobelia is a flower. And as soon as she said it, I knew what it meant because I had researched Ben Major's life and knew that he was an advocate of what was called Thompsonian medicine. This was a popular system of botanical medicine. Um, a lot of people ascribed to it at that time and people made remedies and treatments from plant leaves and roots and berries and bark from trees. And one of the plants they frequently used was Lobelia. So I knew that that was correct. Another, in another instance, now this is page one of his first letter, but there were other pages as well. And toward the end of the letter, there's a passage where Tolbert Major is saying hello to various people in Kentucky that they left behind. And right in the middle of this passage of greetings, the transcriber had this sentence, to God overshines my respects. 
which seemed very odd to us. The wording seemed odd. We, we knew that they were Christian. They talk frequently about their faith. They cite scripture. But even so, that seemed weird to us. And that one took a, long, a much longer time to resolve. It was months and months later. I was looking at the Christian County Census for 1830, and I found a Gideon Overshiner who was Ben's next door neighbor. So what it really said was to Gid Overshiner, my respects. It was a greeting to a neighbor. Um, there were some deeply moving moments, one of which occurred right here at the Kentucky Historical Society. Pam and I were doing research here and um, the Historical Society has uh, several letters that came from New Orleans. Now, when Ben was in his late teens and early 20s, he and one of his brothers went to New Orleans. Their dad had a big farm in Frankfurt and he shipped some of the produce from his farm, some of the, the products of his farm, down the Ohio River to, to uh, New Orleans and where they were sold in a mercantile that he had set up. So these letters are letters from the man running the mercantile. And on one of them, Ben had written a note to his father. And so for the first time, we saw Ben's signature. And all of a sudden, it made him very real to us. One of the little bits of information I had about the colonization movement before I started doing this research was I had heard that Abraham Lincoln kind of supported it. That was the extent of what I knew. In the Library of Congress, um, the, they now hold all of the records of the American Colonization Society. When that group finally closed its doors in 1913, they donated all their material to the Library of Congress. So Pam and I went there for a week. We were there when the doors opened and we didn't leave till they kicked us out at night and we spent a full week reading microfilm. Anybody who's read microfilm on a machine for even an hour will understand that's, uh, that's a lot. But I found the original membership lists for the Colonization Society. And they were set up sort of like an Excel sheet. So over you would have a name in one column and then year after year going toward the right. So I found Ben Major and I found two of his brothers on that list. I found Henry Clay. I found Daniel Webster. I found James Monroe. A lot of very prominent Americans were supporters of the Colonization Society. And then way down the list, I found A. Lincoln, Springfield, Illinois. And so year after year, it's marked that he's still a member. And way over at the right, it says, address change, Washington, D.C. So it confirmed, you know, that he continued to be interested in the colonization movement and supportive of it, even after he became president. Now, Pam liked to talk about what, what she called the Holy Grail. It was this idea that we wanted to find something in Ben's own writing that talked about his feelings about slavery. We felt like this would give us some kind of insight into, into why he made the choices he made. And we found the Holy Grail in the attic in Eureka, Illinois. Ben had written a letter to his brother Joseph in, who was still in Kentucky. Joseph still was holding slaves. This was another example of a family that was divided over this issue. And in this letter, Ben says, he worked very hard to free himself and his family from what he called the curse of slavery. It was pretty clear how he felt about slavery from that letter. Also, as we went along um, answering questions, new questions would crop up. We would find a chunk of information that opened a whole new path of inquiry. At, toward the end of our research, we had two unanswered questions that we still really wanted to understand. We knew the ship that they had gone to Liberia on. We knew the date that they left. We knew the port they headed toward in Liberia. We did not know where they departed from in the United States. And so Pam and I had tried everything we could think of to find an answer to this. We knew the Colonization Society sent ships from Newark, New Jersey, from New York, from Charleston, from New Orleans, from other US ports. We suspected they had departed from either New Orleans or Newark, but we couldn't prove it. And at one point, I made another trip to Washington, D.C. I was at the Smithsonian Museum of American History. They have a research library there, which I had not known before. And one of the staff members there found a newspaper clipping from the time that actually describes the send-off ceremony for the Luna. 
they had a big 4th of July event the day before they departed. This article talks about who spoke, what hymns they sang. It's a very detailed article. It even names some of the people in my story. So that was just this incredible moment. And then another thing we came across, I came across two different accounts talking about, now these people went in 1836, but I came across two different accounts that said one of those people who went on the Luna came back to America in 1858. In fact, came to Illinois, came to Eureka, Illinois, spoke at the first Christian church there, talked about their experiences in Liberia, the challenges they had faced, their hopes for the future. And then when he was done speaking, he went with Ben Major's widow and some of her children to the grave of Ben Major and prayed. I found this just remarkable, but neither one of those articles named the man. And so I had, by process of elimination, I had narrowed it down to two people, but we couldn't prove who it was and we were very frustrated. And then Ancestry.com uploaded New York passenger lists and Pam plugged in one of the names that we thought it might be and it popped up right away. We knew who had gone there. We knew what ship he arrived on. We knew when he arrived. So that was, pretty, that was a pretty incredible find. There were some, some surprises along the way. I'm sure that some of you are thinking, um, how could these people have written letters? Wasn't it illegal to educate slaves in, in the South? What I found, again, there's partial truth to that, but it's not the whole truth. It wasn't illegal to educate people per se, to educate enslaved people. It was only illegal to teach them to read and write. You could teach them other topics if you wanted to, although I'm sure most people did not teach their enslaved people. But it was only reading and writing specifically that they did not want enslaved people to know. But that was not true completely across the South. There were three states where it was not illegal and Kentucky was one of them. We found documentation from somebody who knew Ben Major, who was familiar with him, lived with him at the same, you know, lived during the same time. And, and she said he taught them to read and write before they were liberated and went to Liberia. Another thing I was surprised by um, to find, you know, when we're, you're, uh, when I was in school a long time ago, you know, when we studied pioneers and explorers and settlers, it was typically young men, men in their 20s and 30s. And I had this notion in my head that, the, that primarily those settlers in Liberia would have been men. I was surprised to find out that there were a lot of women, black women and white women, involved in the colonization of Liberia. During the first 20 years of colonization, almost half the settlers were female. 45%, they were often single mothers or widows. Um, of course, during slavery, couples could be taken apart from one another, sold away, but these women came, often came with no male partner and, were, and with young children with them. I thought that was incredibly courageous. And while white men founded the American Colonization Society and white men accounted for 90% of the nation's slave owners, white women slave owners, were more than twice as likely to free their enslaved people for colonization. And they typically freed a greater proportion, all or more of their enslaved people than the white men did. There was a woman named Emily Thomas Tubman. She is a native of Frankfort, Kentucky. She was one of those white women who freed her enslaved people to migration to Liberia. And in fact, one couple that she freed, their grandson ends up becoming president of Liberia. There is a historical marker about Emily Thomas Tubman, less than half a block from here at the Frankfurt Christian Church. One thing that I discovered that surprised me and saddened me was that on average, 20% of those who migrated to Liberia died of malaria within the first year, 20%. This was not for the weak of heart. This was a courageous thing to do. And another thing that saddened me was that once they were settled in Liberia, these people from America did what lots 
of immigrants. Do. They tried to rule the South. In the American South was a two-tiered society with white people on top and black people on the bottom. These black people from America recreated a two-tiered society in Liberia with themselves on the top and indigenous people below them. This inequality in power lasted for a long, long time, even though the Americo-Liberians um, were never a, a majority of the population, but they dominated the political structure and power structure of Liberia until 1980, when there was a coup, followed by two horrific civil wars that have destroyed much of Liberia, and the country is still recovering from that. So my conclusions, I think, um, I think Ben was a decent guy. And that is not an idea we typically associate with the label slave owner. Um, ben was certainly intelligent, he was compassionate, he had a very strong faith, and he valued family, he valued education. He went on in, uh, after he got to Illinois, he went on to found a college that was actually the third college in the nation to admit women on an equal basis with men. And it was a college that became racially integrated not long after it was founded. Um, but the evidence I would cite for saying that Ben was a decent guy was that he did not have to maintain contact with the people that he freed. Most former slave owners did not. They said, goodbye, good luck. Ben didn't do that. He not only corresponded with these people, he bought and shipped supplies at his own expense. He sent them seeds tools, medicine, fabric, books, all kinds of things for them to build a new life in Liberia. The second point I would raise is that Tolbert and those others who went to Liberia, the letters seem to indicate that they certainly respected Ben and that possibly there was real affection and, and caring for him. They frequently ask about his children, his wife. Um, in some of the letters, they address him as dear father. Well, we know there were slave owners who fathered children with their enslaved women through sexual assault. That was not the case here. And the reason I can state that definitively is that I know their ages. Ben was a little boy when Tolbert and Austin were born. It's not possible that he was their biological father. And the third point I would make is that Ben kept these letters. They obviously meant something very, very important. They were very important to him. And his descendants also treasured them for more than a century before they finally donated them to the museum. The other conclusion is that Tolbert, Austin, Agnes, and the others were incredibly courageous. This is a picture of Bassa Cove. This is a drawing done about the time that they would have arrived there, probably a little after they arrived. Um, they left the only home they had ever known to go to a completely foreign country. They were of African descent, but clearly they were not African, they were American. They had been born and raised here, their parents had been, their grandparents, their great-grandparents. They didn't speak any of the languages of Africa. They didn't know anything about the culture or how to grow crops there or anything else. It was completely foreign. They faced an unknown future and they knew that by leaving, they were likely never going to again see the people that they left behind. It's not like they could jump on a plane and come here and visit. They, they were never going to lay eyes on them again. But they went knowing that they would be free, knowing that they could live in a land where they weren't looked down upon because of the color of their skin. They went knowing they could offer their children and their grandchildren a better life. And I think that's all any of us want, is to be able to give our children and grandchildren a better life. Researching and writing this book gave me a deeper perspective on some of the current discussions in this nation. Discussions about systemic racism, about immigration, and about social inequality. So what does it all mean? I start my book with an epigraph, a scripture from the book of Micah 4.4. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. Ultimately, this is a story of a search for peace, security, and liberty in Liberia and in central Illinois. 
These were very real people living on two different continents. They faced tough choices, grueling circumstances, disease, hardship, and multiple tragedies to build new lives. So the book is called Liberty Brought Us Here. It can be ordered through the publisher, which is University Press of Kentucky, and their website is www.kentuckypress.com. If you want to order it that way, if you order by August 17th, you can save 25% off the cover price. If you enter this code when you check out, and the code is in all capital letters, F W A R E. So uh, if you are, have more interest in the book or in me as an author, you can go to my website, www.susanelindsay.com. And with that, I'll stop talking. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. And if you have questions, I would love to answer them for you. Let's see here. I'm going to get off there. Thank you so much, Susan. Oh, my goodness. That, was, that is a fascinating story. And again, I cannot wait. I cannot wait to read the book. Um, and I, I'm going to um, make sure that I post that code uh, and website in the chat. And I will um, send out a follow-up email as well to all of you guys uh, that contains that information. Um, but as she mentioned, we do have some time uh, for questions here. Um, and if you'd like to use the chat box, you can do that, uh, certainly. Or I think our group is probably um, small enough that if you want to try and chime in, um, feel free to unmute yourself and do that. Um, and um, I, think that, I think that'll work too. So I will open the floor, the virtual floor. Anybody? Okay. Anybody? All right. Karen? Are you? Okay. I was just going to say nice comments from people. Thank you. Yes, we do have some good comments. Thank you all. Um, okay. Well, I, I was curious um, at the beginning, and, and you address, but you addressed it in your talk. Um, and um, so, oh, Karen has her hand up. Um, Karen, I'm going to unmute you, I think. Unmute. Okay. I don't know if it's going to let me unmute you. Oh, Karen, you're unmuted. <laughs> um, all right. What question would you like to ask? Thank you um, so much for this book and for your research. I, too, do genealogy research, and I cannot even imagine researching for the era and the and the uh, time frame that you're looking at. Um, I was curious about the role of women in general in the new settlement. And I was very curious since it was named for Henry Clay, um, or it had it as that part of the name, the Clay, whatever. Was there any involvement of, of, him, of the daughters, Laura Clay, the icon of the women's right to vote in Kentucky? Um, not that I know of. Henry Clay was um, an officer with the American Colonization Society for a number of years. He was very heavily involved with it. And in fact, this Emily Thomas Tubman that I mentioned, her father passed away when she was young and Henry Clay was her guardian too. Um, so there's a link there. And then there is a town in Liberia called uh, Ashland named right. after Henry Clay's home here in Kentucky. Um, and there's an area of Liberia called Kentucky in Liberia. And um, the public television uh, station here did a, a program on that several years ago that you can order on DVD. But, but Laura didn't get a chance to make her strike for freedom there. For, for women's right to vote there like she did here. Yeah, I, I, not that I know of, no. The women, um, the women settlers, you know, did the kinds of things you would think they would do. They're holding their families together. They're trying to grow gardens. They're trying to take care of, of children um, who were often dying of malaria or something else. And, um, but many of them also, as I said, so many of them were single parents. You know, they were also trying to make some kind of a right. living to create products that they could trade or being seamstresses or whatever. And um, 
I, I profile, I actually received a grant from the Kentucky Foundation for Women to do research specifically on women's role in this movement. And there's a whole chapter in the book that's, that's devoted to that, both to the role of, of black women who were settlers there, as well as to the white women who were involved in the colonization movement. Okay. Thank you so much. I did see an earlier question that asked if the people were happy to go there. Um, that's a, a more complex question to answer. Um, some of them were. They, there are letters where people talk about they feel like this is the best country for them. Um, in one of the letters later when Liberia becomes a republic, Tolbert says, I'm so glad to live in a free country and be able to have a voice in government. Um, so there were many people who felt very, very good about being there. There were others who did not, who, you know, deeply missed family or who struggled to survive because it was such a harsh environment. Um, there were some who left for other parts of Africa. There were only a few who came back to the U.S., not very many. There were just a few that came back to the United States. Many of them died. Uh, it, was, it was a tough go for a while. And I think I saw a question about, have I gone to Liberia? Uh, unfortunately, I have not. Um, when I started doing this research, I looked into it. Um, airfare is extremely expensive to go from here to Liberia. And I was doing all of this research and writing on my own. I'm not supported by university staff or anything else. Um, and the other thing was, um, because of these two civil wars in Liberia, uh, the country's infrastructure is in bad shape. There's no national electrical grid. Um, the capital country, the capital city of Monrovia has no working sewer system. Um, clean water, healthcare, those kinds of things are hard to access. And I, I felt like it, my safety might have been at risk if I were to travel there by myself at that time. So I chose not to go. I did, however, invite a number of Liberian people to read the early drafts of the book and give me feedback. I wanted to make sure I got the story right. And, uh, and their feedback was incredibly helpful to me. Other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, hi. Uh, this, thank you so much for this presentation. It was incredible. Um, oh, you're welcome. Uh, I had once met somebody, um, she lives in New York, I'm forgetting where her family was from, but they actually did go to Liberia, but they came back. And uh -huh. you did mention um, that there were some who came back. Do you know of any uh, specific examples, especially related to Kentucky, about people who did make that decision to come back? Um, most of the people who came back in those early years came back to serve as um, uh, sort of salespeople for the colonization society. So they would go around the South with the colonization agents and talk to other, to enslaved people and say, here's my experience as a black person in Liberia. This is what I went through. So they were sort of a voice uh, to try to encourage other people to go. And of course, when the Fugitive Slave Act passed, then it became extremely dangerous for people to come here because they could be pulled into slavery again, um, or for the first time, if they were freeborn, they could be pulled into slavery um, by coming to the United States. When these wars broke out in the 1980s and 1990s, um, at that point, many people who were descended from these Americo Liberians did return to the United States. There's estimates way, range widely, but they're somewhere between, between a quarter of a million and half a million Liberians currently living in the United States and Canada who left that country because of the violence during those wars. Yeah, the woman I know whose family who came back, it was like around like 1900. I got to reach out to her again to get more of the info. Oh, that'd um, be great. Uh, but uh, yeah, thank you so much. This has been so enlightening. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for your question. Other questions? I wanted to ask, um, I was, when you said that the colonization society existed until 1913, um, that, that really surprised me. Um, were they actively still recruiting people and, and, and trying to, um, trying to, you know, send, send immigrants to Liberia, um, 
that that you know into the 20th century or or when did that effort kind of stop um, they they did quit sending ships prior to that and i can't recall the exact date but in those decades following the civil war there were many people who were newly freed who chose to go to africa still so they were still actively sending sending ships up through the first several decades after the civil war interesting if any of you have ever watched the television show History Detectives, um, they at one point have a letter where uh, a man is talking about going to Liberia. And this was like in the, I want to say 1890s or so. And, uh, and he was talking about going through the colonization movement to be able to settle in Liberia. Miss, hi. Hi. Hi, I'm not sure if you have any <clears throat> if you'll be able to answer that or how deep your, your knowledge of modern day Liberia goes, but is there any discord or, uh, um, or what is the relationship of modern li day Liberians who have ancestors that, that emigrated or I guess emigrated to Liberia mm -hmm. and, and native born Africans without any kind of, of um, American? Um, there has been friction um, between those two groups. And uh, as I said, a lot of that came from these American Liberians who, who created this um, unequal society and who dominated politics for so long. Um, and when, the, when that erupted, it erupted very, very violently. Um, there was a, a military coup led by a, a sergeant named Samuel Doe. They broke into the executive mansion, pulled the president out of bed in his pajamas and disemboweled him. And then they rounded up his cabinet ministers and had a firing squad on the beach. Um, and that triggered two wars, uh, one with Samuel Doe and then Charles Taylor was president. And there was a, an extreme amount of violence going on for, for a long time in Liberia. Um, I think that Liberians, I, and I am not, a, I'm a, an expert on modern day Liberia, but the impression that I get is that, you know, there's, there certainly are people who are clinging to those, to their indigenous identities, and um, maybe there's longstanding feuds between their group and somebody else's group. But I get the sense that people are starting to realize they all have to work together to rebuild this country because it's going to, it's going to take a while. It's going to take all hands on deck to do that. I, I loved hearing about your research journey. Um, just, uh, I, I just finished up a master's thesis and I was like, mm -hmm, yes, I, I, I'm feeling that. Um, but the, um, we, one of the programs that KHS sponsors um, is a National History Day in Kentucky. Um, mm -hmm. And it's for, you know, for students who, it's, it's almost like science fair, but for history projects. Right, right, right. Um, and I just, in hearing about your, your journey, as I've looked at kids' projects over the years, you know, I've wanted to kind of, I just almost wish we could have you talk to them about, you know, all of these different sources that you consulted. So we may have to hit you up sometime. Um, it's perfectly okay. I mean, it's such an amazing story and, and, and to hear you talk about getting to visit their attic and, uh, you know, and, and the first time you saw his signature and, you know, um, I just, I feel like that would be really inspiring for some of those students. It has been, it's been an incredible, it's been an incredible journey on it. So, yes. Right. Well, if there are not any more questions, um, then we um, can go ahead and wrap things up. I did post in the chat box um, the website and um, the code that you can use for the 25% off if you order before August 17th. Um, and, oh, Deborah. I was um, going to say, I do see another yeah. question here. Um, do we have time for me to answer sure. that? Yeah, go okay. for it. So, um, I actually have a couple different ideas in mind for my next research project. But the one I'm most excited about actually is, is kind of a Schindler's List story. It's about a, a diplomat from Portugal who ends up uh, against the orders of his boss, um, pulling together 30,000 uh, visas for people to get out of Europe uh, in the, the years before, just immediately before the Holocaust. So um, he was a very fascinating man. I love those kinds of stories. I love the history. What was his name? Uh, it, it's, it's a Portuguese name, obviously. It's, 
something D'Souza, but I can't recall his full name. I, I have just started research on it, so yes. Um, all right. Well, I will um, uh, do a follow-up email that also contains the um, website and the and the um, the discount code so that everyone um, can have that. I'm sure you're all going to want to get a copy of Liberty brought us here. Um, and as soon, I, I, hopefully we will have some in the KHS um, gift shop soon as well. Um, COVID has made getting new inventories kind of kind of special. So, um, but pretty soon, I hope that we will have some. Um, uh, Susan did bring us some postcards uh, so that we can advertise it for her. Um, again, we have recorded today's session and um, our social media manager, Greg uh, Hardison, is going to be posting this to our YouTube channel so that it will be widely available. Um, we encourage you to share it uh, widely. Uh, such a fascinating story. So I will uh, send a link for that as well. May also get a survey from me. So if you if you see that, please please do tell us, uh, give us your feedback. We really appreciate that. Um, so next month uh, for our first Friday on September fourth, I think it is, um, <laughs> going into Derby weekend, um, we will be having. Um, as our guest, um, Dr. Ann Marshall um, from the uh, from Mississippi State University, and she is going to be talking about the subject of Confederate memory uh, here in Kentucky. Um, so certainly, uh, I, I scheduled it months ago. Didn't realize that Def Jefferson Davis would be removed from the Capitol Rotunda um, just uh, just prior. So uh, it's definitely a prescient topic and one that uh, I think we need to be having more conversations about. So she's going to give us some really really um, deep background information uh, on that specifically related to Kentucky. So I'm pretty excited that she's going to be joining us. Uh, so hope we hope you uh, to see you again next month. Um, and thank you again for your attention today. We always love having you with us. All right. Bye, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.